Why is it that you are obsessed with Adi Yogi? Isn't it like being uh, making it about the <laughs> container and not the contained? Adi Yogi is not an obsession. Adi Adi Yogi is a plan. You talked about nothing. We must understand this nothing. English language has certain limitations on these aspects, but we can, because we are speaking that language, we can manipulate it a little bit. If you want to understand nothing, you must put a hyphen between no and thing. It's not a thing. That doesn't mean it does not exist. This would have been a ridiculous statement for the Western minds. I'm saying Western minds because all of us are Western educated. Maybe we're living in India, we've born in India, grown up in India, but we are all Western educated. For a Western mind, this would be a ridiculous idea of a couple of decades or, decades or maybe three decades ago it would have been so. But now science is talking about no things. That means non-physical dimension of existence, something that is not a thing but still a powerful force. When I say something that's not a thing, we are not talking about nuclear energy, we are not talking about, uh, you know, uh, electrical energy or a magnetism or anything. Simply nothingness is tremendously powerful. Today they're calling it, uh, you know, black existence or dark existence or dark power or many things are being used. So essentially you're talking about a dimension which is a source of something. Now this is something, this is something, everything here is something. But this has come from all that we call as nothing because it's not a physical form. A physical form in essence means a certain defined boundary. You call this a physical body because this is a defined boundary. If there is no defined boundary, this cannot be physical. So when we said yoga, this union that your inclusiveness you're poking at me <laughs> is essentially that you transcended your physical nature, so you are not a something anymore. Once you are not a something, there is no defined boundary for you. Once there is no defined boundary for you, union is the only way you can exist. There is no other way to exist. This is not just a concept, this is a living experience, this is the reality of the cosmos. That if you look up in the sky, even a little child looks up in the sky, you will count stars. Maybe there are millions and billions of stars out there, but still, all the stars put together, they do not occupy even one percent of the space out there, isn't it? But nobody pays attention to that space, that is nothing. So this ninety-nine percent or more, ninety-nine point nine percent is vast nothingness in this few specks of something. But your attention is only there simply because your visual apparatus are made like that. You are not able to grasp what is not there? You only see whatever stops light in the sense you are able to see this hand simply because it's stopping light and reflecting. So your ability to see is always limited to whatever stops light. See right now we are sitting here, our microphone, our light, everything is important but the most important thing is the air that we are breathing for our existence right now. But we cannot see it. Does it mean to say we can do without it? So that which you cannot see, that which you cannot touch, that which you cannot perceive through five sense organs, that is called a no thing or a nothing. That's called shiva. Shiva means that which is not. Now, if somebody begins to experience that as a living experience, we refer to him also as shiva. But somebody who has not experienced it, we refer to him also. Half the people in this country at one time were named after shiva. That is all the men, I'm saying. <laughs> Ladies were uh, Shiva, you know, Shivangi, Shiva this, Shiva that or Parvati, Gauri, this one, that one. Why this was so is constant reminder that you need to look beyond what is there in front of you. This physical form of being a man or a woman or this person I like, this person I don't like, beyond this, when I call him Shiva, 
Now I cannot see, say I like him or dislike him. When, when your name is Shiva, you claimed already you are Shiva. When your name is Shiva, when I call you Shiva, I cannot call Shiva angrily. I cannot do something. It's a kind of a control over yourself that you cannot abuse somebody. You cannot say, hey Shiva, you are this and that. You can only say Shiva. <laughs> so we created a culture like this where constant reminder, constant reminder, wherever you look, we even called our dog Shiva. Yes, we never thought it's an insult because he's as much life as you are. We called, if you see a tree we say Shiva, if we see a rock we say Shiva, if we see a bird we say Shiva. Simply because the source of all that exists here as physical stuff essentially comes from that which is not a thing or no thing or Shiva. So this is why this talk about third eye and people think their forehead is going to crack and something is going to pop out, <laughs> nothing like that. These two eyes can show you only that which stops light. The day you start seeing things which do not stop light, then we say you have one more eye going. You have an inner eye which is able to see something that these two eyes cannot see. So third eye does not mean forehead cracking up and you becoming some kind of a freak out. <laughs> this just that means your clarity has opened up that you are able to see beyond the limitations of senses. So all the enlightened people who've been… How many did you meet? Like I've heard about <laughs> many. Like you know say Krishna or Muhammad or, um, or Ram or Christ, Buddha, you know all the enlightened people who've been on this planet, there is some sort of mention of their birth or death. But when it comes to Shiva, uh, like you say, he, and I've read that he was self-created and, um, and I often ask you this question that, um, that did he like disappear into thin air and apparently something like that happened. Uh, he couldn't even have biological children with any of the women he was married to. Uh, also he, uh, he… Uh, At least you can't blame him for the population. <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I'm coming to something very important. There is a theory. I thought population was very important No, no, no. Too. There is a theory that Shiva is alien. Yeah. Till now you've been talking about inclusiveness and suddenly you call somebody an alien. No, no Sadhguru, there is a theory… I, I must tell you this, every time I enter United States, the… at the immigration, I end up standing in that line which says, uh, resident alien. I look around and see I'm the only one who fits the description. Sadhguru, l let me finish this question. So there is this theory… There is this theory that she won't let you go on. No, that everything that humans encounter, whether it's an idea, it's a thought, it's anything, anything that they encounter, it's been it's been transmitted into them through an outer space, a, an outer being. My favorite director, Christopher Nolan, made this film, Interstellar, which is one of my favorite films, where they are constantly referring to certain beings as they. They are communicating, they are talking to us, they are doing this, but they never really clarified who they were, like were they aliens, were they gods, who they were. And, uh, and, and Sadhguru, like this, this I, th I felt it in, like when, when any creative idea comes to me, it has absolutely no intellectual grounds where I can go back and track it down. It's literally like a mail dropped in my head. This it seems a, like it's from this, an outside this space. Is not a confession. <laughs> I know it's a confession, but, but, but Sadhguru, is it that we, we are being operated by an external, like sort of outside beings? Is, is it that? Well, uh, People who have no faith in human intelligence are looking up that intelligence will come from somewhere else. What we need to understand is, see, there are certain things which are very significant things in this country which unfortunately this present generation has completely forgotten or very few people are reminded and the rest of the world, some places they recognize, rest of the places it's not there. What the thing is just this. Here, we consider things like this. For example, in yoga, we call your spine the center of the universe. We call it Merudhanda. That means it's the axis of the universe. What is a universe? Please understand this. Today scientists are admitting it is an endless universe. 
Forever they said, if you travel this many million light years, you will reach the end of the universe. But now they are admitting it's an endless universe. Forever we've been saying it's an ever-expanding universe. So we said, your spine is the axis of the universe. That sounds ridiculous. Even without putting any load, most people's backs are hurting badly. <laughs> they can't even <laughs> walk or run or do anything. If this becomes the axis of the universe, what will happen? Why we are saying this is, See, you know there is a universe or you think there is a universe only by your experience, isn't it so? If you did not experience, if you did not… if you could not see this, if you could not see like this and feel like this, you wouldn't know there is a universe. Only because of your experience there is a universe. And the center where your experience is being transmitted is through your spine. If you cut a few wires in your spine, you will have no experience even of the body, forget about the universe. So because your… your ability to experience the universe is rooted and centered in your spine, we are calling your… your spine as the axis of the universe. Suppose this hall, see now we know the boundaries of this hall. Now we can debate whether this is the center of this hall or that is the center of this hall. Suppose there are no boundaries to this hall, how would you decide which is the center of this hall? Where you are is the center of the hall, isn't it? From this basis, we developed a whole possibility for a human being, how not just to believe these things but to make it into a living experience. It is from this the word yoga came, that the inclusiveness happens not because I tell you, oh I love you, you love me and all this stuff. Inclusiveness happens simply because you obliterate the boundaries of your individuality. Not because I love you, you love me, I hug you, you hug me, so because we are inclusive, no. All that will last for some time, tomorrow if they do something that you don't like, it will be finished. But you obliterate the boundaries of your individual nature, including your body, that you know how to sit here without being identified with the boundaries of who you are. Your physical structure, your mental structure, your emotional structure has a boundary. It may be large or small, no I'm not talking about the body being large, it may be large or small but it has a boundary. But there are dimensions which have no boundary. What doesn't have a boundary is non-physical in nature. So our focus has always been on that dimension which is non-physical. That is why Shiva became the most important thing because Shiva means that which is not, that which is non-physical. Now is he… The, the yogi that we are talking about, is he a, a human being, is he… did he come from somewhere else? There are many things… Uh, <laughs> this audience need to be primed for this because it's a long story you are asking. I'm trying to encapsulate it in two minutes, that's dangerous because it looks silly. Let me… there is a book, uh, Arundhati is here, uh, you know, we spoke together and she kind of uh, put it together. And there's a book on uh, Adiyogi, uh, which is going into these aspects, but let me put it across. See, there are things. As you said, there is no parentage. When you talk about Shiva, there is no parentage, there's no place of birth, there's nobody saw him as a young boy to grow up. All the time when we saw him, he was about the same age. And we don't know where he died, such a significant human being even in those times, if he died somewhere, they must have… they should have built a temple, they should have built a, some kind of a monument for him, nothing like that happened. So there is no birth, there is no death, there is no parentage, there is no siblings, there is no anything to prove that he was here. Does it mean to say we can assume he came from somewhere? Not necessarily, but in many of the… if you look at the lore, it's very common to refer to Shiva as Yaksha Swarupa. This means, Yakshas means always those… those kind of beings which are not human but who supposed to have existed in the natural env environment in this planet, in the forest and other things. Whatever we were referring to, some kind of beings or creatures or whatever you want to call them, who are not human in nature. So many, many times in the lore, you will see any number of songs and other things talking about Shiva as a Yaksha Swarupa. So there are many things which point but there is no specific proof that he came from elsewhere. 
One thing is the level of intelligence in terms of his mathematics, his music and uh, his geometry, what he thought in terms of that. When you look at it, the times that we are referring to, see, uh, in the yogic culture, let me admit this in front of this uh, crowd because, oh my God, there are cameras. Uh, in the yogic lore, it is estimated Shiva or Adi Yogi existed as a person, he walked this land somewhere between 60 to 75,000 years ago. When I sp first spoke this, all the more sensible people around me who are not as naive as me, they're wiser people, younger people, they said, Sadhguru, if you say 75,000, they will blast you. The only archaeological proof that is there that Adi Yogi or Shiva existed is about 12,600 years. You should say 12,600 or 13,000 or 14,000. I said, okay, 15,000. <laughs> but actually in the yogic lore, there is a clear aspect of they're talking about celestial arrangements. These celestial arrangements, if you go by the modern astronomy, they existed only somewhere between 60 to 80,000 years in that span. There is no two ways about it, the things that he is talking about. And uh, now, off uh, the Cambay, what's, the, what's it called? In, uh, what is the Indian name for that? I'm sorry. Kumbhat, uh, is it? Yeah. Off the Gulf of Kumbhat. Now they've done explorations. They actually went there to clean up the plastic. But then they found a city which is five square miles. And now international archaeologists from, especially from Germany and France, they have dated this according to carbon dating uh, process that it is a minimum of 32,000 years. 32,000 years ago, nowhere on this planet did a city exist. Not just a city did not exist, the idea of a city did not exist. But they had a city which is five square miles in size properly, orderly way of doing things. It's been buried, they're estimating it was, it has gone underwater for about 9,000 years. And similarly, of course, everybody has heard about Dwaraka. There are, there are excavations, which unfortunately now is the line of control between India and Pakistan, you can't touch it. If you dig, <laughs> something else will happen, you will hit the mines. <laughs> so, there is enough proof today, archaeological proof to say, over 30,000 years ago, there was a civilized society here. Maybe not across the country, but in pockets it existed. So this dating goes back like this. So I'm just saying over 15,000 years. So that when I travel west also, I look sensible. Okay, 15,000, all right. 75,000, they'll resist because their idea of the world is only 3,000 years old. They said everything happened in six days and it's only 3,000 years old. Anything beyond 3,000 3, years is not scientific. This has been the approach, unfortunately. Now slowly they're correcting themselves without looking stupid. But it's utterly stupid. For all these centuries you insisted it's only 3,000 years. Now you're slowly extending it because science comes and says something else. You will watch it in the next 50 years. Science will come and say, modern science will come and say many things which we have been talking for thousands of years. Devidhani tantrani shatadvadashani Vegai tumimam samsara pasham Chaturoham kintu tantra jale patam Nashatnom yaham kartum yakkim api mahyam Vedai tu bimam 